All right, I'd like to thank everyone for being here this afternoon. We're actually two minutes ahead of schedule, which is a rarity in this building, as I'm sure you all know. Um, I'm just going to, I just have the, the briefest of opening remarks, and most of the uh, talking today will be done by Chief Crawl, uh, and he's going to lead us through a presentation of uh, some of the items that are now being released uh, publicly, the 911 call, um, the radio traffic uh, when the uh, shots were fired, uh, certainly the video from the body-worn camera, uh, a post that was uh, made on Facebook we're going to play. Um, and so he can, he'll, he'll talk you through that certainly better than, than I would be able to. I just want to, the only thing I want to emphasize at the beginning um, uh, would be that uh, we take uh, transparency very seriously uh, in this administration, this police department. Uh, the the uh, event that took place uh, early Saturday morning uh, was obviously a uh, traumatic and tragic event for everyone involved. Uh, certainly for uh, the family of, the, of Mr. O'Neill uh, but also for the officers that were involved. Everything about uh, an incident like this is, uh, is awful for everyone involved. Um, there is sometimes a temptation um, when organizations uh, face um, you know, difficult moments like this to withhold information, to turn inward, to become defensive, that has never been our policy. Uh, and in fact, just the opposite. Uh, we shine the light on our operations, um, I think, more successfully and uh, truthfully than most other cities in this country. Um, this is the second incident of this kind since I have been mayor. The first was in the summer of 2018. Many of you may remember uh, the incident over at LaGrange and Hudson. Uh, Saturday morning is the second uh, such event. Both terrible events, tragedies for all involved. <clears throat> what I want to emphasize in, is that in both cases, the administration and the department uh, has responded with almost immediate transparency, releasing uh, video, audio, information, in a, in a spirit of uh, cooperation and openness that I, I hope is understood and appreciated, I can say. I think we've all seen examples around the country where an event like this would take place and the information we are releasing today takes days, weeks, months. In one recent case in the city of Chicago, it literally took years before information like this was released we are releasing it darn near immediately. And I think that whatever um, we may think when we see this video and hear it, it's going to be, um, I think, whenever there's a situation like this, we are always likely uh, to view uh, these incidents through the prism of our own life experiences. But no matter how we react, to the information, it is always in our best interest to release it and to provide it and to be open about it. And so the chief will, can walk through the specifics, but I want to emphasize uh, that one of the co our core values 
uh, on this and so many other things is that we provide transparent openness uh, even during our city's toughest moments. And, and that's something that we take very seriously. So with that, um, I know the chief has a lot uh, to talk us through and walk through, and so I will turn it over to him. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Before I get started, I want to recognize Councilman Delaney, who is here today as a chairperson of the Criminal Justice, or whatever your committee is called, Chris, thanks for being here. <laughs> chief Brian Bird from TFRD, and the president and first vice president of the Toledo Police Patrolmen's Association. As the mayor said, we're going to be going through a rather lengthy, but I feel very well put together PowerPoint that shows exactly what happened early Saturday morning. <clears throat> There's a few videos you're going to see. There's some stills that we're going to show you. Before we do the videos, I'm going to, I have some talking points that you can look at when we provide you all of the information. You can look at specific times where you can say, okay, a certain person said this, a certain person said this. So I'm going to try to break it down as much as possible. Um, all right, Kelly. Again, this happened in, at 630 Leach Street over on the east side. And you can see from the ellipse, that is the corner apartment where, where the incident happened. The suspect, Kwame O'Neill, a 47-year-old black male, last known address, it was in Marion, Ohio. Um, in New Jersey, where he is from, he has convictions or charges for aggravated assault on a police officer, possession of drugs, receiving stolen property, assault, making terroristic threats, resisting arrest, and possession of a weapons and firearms. In Ohio, he only had two obstructing official business charges. Involved officer number one, Officer Michael Benninghoff, 34-year-old white male, um, hired in September of 2012. He's assigned to Unit 419 out of the Central District Station, which means the east side is his primary beat every day. Um, as you can see, he has no active discipline in his file, and he did file, fire excuse me, his service weapon. The second officer is Officer William Clark. He's a 31-year-old black male, hired October 15th of 2013. Again, he's assigned full-time to the east side out of the Central District Station. He as well has no active discipline in his file, and he fired his service weapon as well. Involve officer number three, Officer Grant Parton, 26-year-old white male, hired in July of 17. Again, working unit 428, which is a dedicated east side unit. He as well has no active discipline, and he also fired his weapon. And finally, we have Officer Brandon Burton, 26-year-old white male, hired in July of 17, working unit 428. Again, we, we try to stress beat integrity, and all four of these officers are assigned full-time to the east side, so this is, this is where they work every day. <clears throat> As the other three officers, there are no active discipline in his file, and he also fired his weapon. A lot of times people say, well, how many times have you been there before? So we looked. Not in 2019. In 2020, we were there three times. The first time in March, where Mr. O'Neill wanted to file a missing persons report on his girlfriend, uh, Kristen Glisson. Then in August, an anonymous neighbor called and said there were two black males and a black female fighting, or arguing rather. And then five day, or four days later, in the same month, Kristen called in a menacing, menacing regarding an unknown male who was threatening a killer who was standing in front of the apartment. That's the only time we've been there to that building. <clears throat> now, before we play the 911 recording, I want to warn everybody that there's a lot of profanity and racial slurs, and it's really hard to hear. So that's why we want to provide you with the, the times on the, the recordings where you can, you can listen to this. So 48 seconds into the 911 call, uh, she said, he hit me in my head. At a minute and 45 seconds, the victim again talks about her head injury, saying, I don't want to get medical, but he pushed me down to the floor or stairs, and my head hurts so bad. It's really garbled, but that's what we're believing we heard. At the two minute and nine second mark, I got a effing month old baby in here. I can't get med medical. My head's not bleeding, but it's throbbing. At two minutes and 29 seconds of the video, possibly, again, this is what we're, we're interpreting, he threw me down on the floor. At the three minute and 59 mark, 
the head of my back, I'm sorry, the back of my head is throbbing. At the four minute and 43 second time frame, she said again, he threw my head onto the floor. At 5.15, you'll hear Mr. O'Neill say, I'm ready to effing go. That'll be the, it's kind of important because that's the same audio that you're going to hear on his Facebook Live video. At 5.35, the victim said, I'm going to kill this MFR. He keeps threatening me. I'm going to kill him. The victim again tells the operator her head injury is hurting and he threw me on the floor. He made me hit my head against the floor. Um, so we'll go ahead and play the video now. Again, it's really, it's, it's hard to hear, but here we go. There's your emergency. It's going to be terrible. Did you say Leach Avenue? Yes, what is the address on Leach? 630 Leach. 630 Leach Avenue? Mm -hmm. Okay, what's your name? Kirsty. What is that? Kirsty. Kirsty? Kirsty. 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 Okay. Okay, so what's going on? I need you to take a deep breath. I can't understand you. Your child's father did what? What is his name? 
Before we move on, I think it's uh, it's important to give a shout out to that 911 call taker who did a fantastic job. You could tell that that woman was in a state of panic. She was she was terrified. She was injured. She was at she was almost to the point of hyperventilating. Yet this call taker had the wherewithal to calm her down, to get information on the suspect that the officers knew going into that. I don't know who this call taker is, but I am going to find out, and I'm going to make sure she knows 
how what a fantastic job she did. The next thing we're going to play is the radio traffic when the officers call out for shots fired. Um, all unrelated radio traffic and dead air has been excluded. Um, again, you, you're going to hear it, and you're going to hear the, the 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 level of the voices from the officers. Um, the not excitement, but adrenaline pump. So we'll go ahead and play that. Put it on domestic with medical six thirty leash time thirty five after midnight. Copy. Thirty five after midnight. Okay. Fourth leash. Fourth leash. Fourth leash out of domestic with medical for six thirty leash. We have a female caller saying that she was intoxicated by her child. Correction. <coughs> she was assaulted by her intoxicated child's father. She's requesting medical. She's whispering and locked herself in the bathroom. Your suspect's going to be a Plamaine O'Neill, the black male wearing a gray hoodie. 630 Leach, Port Leach. Okay, next thing we're going to show is the body-worn camera footage from Officer Benninghoff. We chose this officer's footage because it had the best vantage point of everything that happened. Very graphic, um, I'm not going to lie. Um, let me give you some of the bullet points here. I want you to note what the, while the officers are walking up to this location, no guns are drawn. I believe they're talking about a song that they heard on the radio, so, something like that, just small talk. At a minute and 19, you can hear the officers knocking on the door, um, and all you hear is Mr. O'Neill saying, just open the door, uh, or I'm sorry, the officers were saying, just open the door, and you can hear Mr. O'Neill yelling, put the baby in the closet, don't act like you're scared now. At a minute and 37, you hear Mr. O'Neill say, "Put my baby in the closet. If you don't, we're all going to go the same. We're all going the same way." I just called my family. At a minute and 53 seconds, you can hear Mr. O'Neill yelling at the victim to open the door, meaning the bathroom, not not the front door, as evidenced by the pounding. Officers hearing this decided to force entry, um, hearing the yelling and not getting any response. At two at the two minute and eight second mark, as the door is being kicked. You hear O'Neill say, I'm about to die. 
At the 2 minute and 12 second mark, officers force entry and clearly announce their presence. At 2.14, you hear again, I'm about to die. At 2.19 is when the shots fired call comes over the radio. Both dispatchers and officers on scene call for medical to come inside after the shooting. You'll see one officer holding his firearm on the suspect and kick his weapon away, which you'll see by a still is right by his hand. At that point, they held on the suspect until they ran upstairs to check on the woman who was hiding in the bathroom. The officers verbally check to make sure they're okay, and one officer handcuffs the suspect because until we know what's going on, that person's under arrest. So the suspect was handcuffed. At the four minute and 30 second mark, Officer Benninghoff asks for medical to come inside. And then at the 438 mark, you'll see one of our officers commit performing CPR on Mr. O'Neill. Then you'll see medical come inside and uh, Officer Benninghoff instructs any approaching people to leave the crime scene. Mm -hmm. You'll hear audio in a few seconds. There's a delay. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, I take that away from him. No, just that, that, that can stay like that. Keep, yeah. keep it down. <clears throat> As I said, incredibly graphic and, and totally unnecessary. The next thing we're going to show, are we going to do the stills? or well, they're not stills. Okay. The, this is stills of what you just saw from the body-worn camera. You can see the suspect coming around with the gun at the high ready position. And... Here's one where an officer is illuminating him with his flashlight. This shadow you see here is an extended magazine which holds 20 rounds by itself. So in total, there were 21 rounds in this gun waiting to be fired, and he's at the high ready pointing them at the officers. Again, his arm, hand, gun right there. That's why you saw one officer holding him down and another one come up and kick the gun away from his reach area. Extended magazine, which is against the law by itself. Um, it was a nine millimeter semi-automatic handgun. As fast as he could squeeze the trigger, rounds were coming out of that gun. Just a different, just a different um, view of the same weapon. Okay. <clears throat> I want to apologize in advance for what you're about to hear. Extreme profanity and racial slurs are throughout this entire video. Um, you can see the, the emotional and agitated state uh, of Mr. O'Neill as, as, as you watch the video. I want to make sure we're, we're all on the same page here that we found out about this video after the shooting. So I'm going to go through the, the bullet points as I had before. 22 seconds in, you're going to hear Whatever's going to come to me, going to come to me. 28 seconds into the video, I might be signing my death warrant right now, or death certificate. 36 seconds in, if an MF come here and touch me, I'm going to die because I ain't going to effing jail. A minute 10, she's calling this detective, and if you come over with some rowdy A.S., sorry, I'm trying to be politically correct here, um, I'm going to knock him out. And if he pull on me, well, let's just say the best mf -er man win, because I ain't going out without fighting. A minute 36 seconds in. But at the end of the day, I ain't dying without taking somebody with the F with me. A minute 45 into the video. They coming with me. They coming. With me tonight, because I ain't going alone. I ain't going alone. I don't give a F who she called. I don't give a F who she called. Brother, police, anybody. I ain't going alone. I'm ready. Two minutes and 14 seconds into the video. This might record my death tonight because if anyone comes to my MF house wanting to talk, I ain't saying S and I ain't going to jail so they can come how they come. Two minutes and 37 seconds into the video. I'm ready to go. I'm ready. You'll hear this multiple times. Now at 2.57, it's either make them come kill me or they can come kill me. I'm ready to effing go. Three minutes and 12 seconds in, and if they pull, may the best man win. Three minutes and 23 seconds into the video. F that and I'm ready. You'll hear this multiple times. Um, the, and then you'll hear after that, you could hear in the 911 when he was yelling, you'll hear the similar things. Hey, world. How y'all doing? I don't know. I 
I just feel as though I have to record tonight on, um, I feel some type of way, and whatever's going to come to me, going to come to me tonight, uh, I just might be signing my death certificate, so if that's what it is, it is what it is, I'm ready, and if motherfucker come here and touch me, I'm going to die. Cause I ain't going to fucking jail. You know what I mean? I'm gonna get fuck who she called and how this work out. Auntie, I love you. Auntie, come get my daughter. She's not mentally sane to take care of my daughter. Don't get fuck who see this. I don't, I don't. You know what I mean? Cause I'm tired right now. She invited people into her house, started an argument. She starts an argument with me. You know, at the end of the day, she called him this detective. And if he come over here with some rowdy ass shit, I'm gonna knock him out. And if he pull on me, well, let's just say, me the best motherfucking man win. Cause I ain't going out without fighting. And she locked herself in the bathroom like I did some to her. She up there lying. She lying on me. This is how black men get killed. But at the end of the day, I ain't dying without taking somebody what the fuck with me. Don't give a fuck. Don't give a fuck. They coming with me. They coming with me tonight. Because I ain't going alone. I ain't going alone. Don't give a fuck who she called. Brother, police, anybody. I ain't going alone. Y'all ready. I'm ready. You know what I mean? I'm going to sit this to the side. I ain't going to talk. But I'm just going to let y'all know. It's going to be to the side. This might record my death tonight. Because if anybody comes to my motherfucking house wanting to talk, I ain't saying shit. And I ain't going to jail. So they come how they come. And I'm recording everything. I love y'all. Stand by for the update because I'm ready to go. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, some final notes. Um, the female caller who was in the restroom became very uncooperative and uh, didn't seek medical, <coughs> excuse me, medical treatment on scene. Uh, the infant was in the home unharmed. She wouldn't give us any information, name, uh, age of the child. Um, LMHA will be for providing support services to the victim and to the surrounding um, neighbors. <coughs> Obviously. Um, that was a dynamic situation that night. Um, no police officer wants to use deadly force. I can tell you that right now. I've been doing this job for 30 years. Um, the investigation's not over. We'll still, hey, we still have to do interviews with the officers and any witnesses. There will be a firearms review board, as in the case with all of these officer-involved shootings. And the final packet will be delivered to the uh, Lucas County Prosecutor's Office for presentation to a grand jury. Um, any, any questions that if I can't answer, we have some detectives here with us. Chief, when you watch that video, how many shots were fired and do you feel that all of them were justified by the four officers? 32 and yes. Um, what you, what, watching a 2D video doesn't give you the, um, give you the, the, 
real perception of what that room looked like. That room was probably a quarter of the size of the room we're standing in now. We have four officers who enter that room and we hear, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. And they see a person come around the corner with a, a gun pointed at their face. Now, that wouldn't be the time where they would have said, Lieutenant Lenhart, you handle the threat, I'll, I'll have your back, I'll, I'll be a watch. All four of those officers perceived a threat to them, rightfully so. Um, God knows if they waited, how many rounds that person could have fired. And we already have one tragedy here. Now you could have had one or two police officers being shot. So yes, if 32 rounds does seem excessive, but you have four officers in that space, all with a gun within, their, within five or six feet to their face. So um, I do not have a problem with that at all. After the fact, why did they not immediately render aid if 32 shots were fired? Did, did that suspect still pose a threat to the officers at that point? Well, you gotta remember, we have a victim that's upstairs. Our first responsibility is to make sure that that woman and that baby is okay. That's why you saw the officer holding the gun on the suspect. The minute we made sure that she was okay, you saw the video, you heard it. They said, doing life-saving measures, called for fire to come in, and you could see the officer doing CPR. So we have to make sure that the scene is secure first before we start getting ahead of ourselves. Probably they went to handcuff him before rendering that aid? Yes, yes. Hey, Chief, can you talk a little bit about how officers, when they go into a scene like that, everybody thinks differently, they see different scenarios, and that not everybody just pulls their trigger once, everybody has a different mm -hmm. reaction. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, we have four officers who are being confronted with an armed man. Um, we have one officer who fired his, his, his weapon twice. We have one that fired it seven times. We had an officer who fired 10 times. We had another one that fired 13 times. So it, it all depends on where they are in the scenario. I mean, if we have an officer behind another one, tactically that might not be the, the time to, to fire that many rounds. But each officer did what they felt at that time was, was necessary. He was hit 19 times. Was it hit 19? Yes, 19 times. And no, he never fired. And the, the, this is, this is the, the question that a lot of police chiefs get in officer-involved shootings. A lot of folks don't agree with it. They don't believe in it. But the fact of the matter is we don't have to be shot at before using deadly force. Those officers made entry. They knew it was a violent domestic violence scene. They were encountered a guy with a gun. If they were waited, if they waited to be shot at, they would have been very possibly killed. Chief, last time we had this, what, I guess over two years ago now with the Wolverine with the Hudson one, you had us do a media shoot, don't shoot training. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, uh, answer the question, if you will, of those who say, why don't you shoot to injure instead of, you know, shoot to kill when, I know you've explained it before, but go over that again. We're, we're not trained to shoot to wound. We're not, we don't shoot guns out of hands. We don't go for legs. In that case, when a, a Toledo police officer or a police officer anywhere in this country pulls their gun to defend themselves, to defend others, that's a deadly force situation and we're taught to shoot center mass. If we were trying to shoot a leg in a dynamic, stress-filled situation, you're gonna miss. A, I don't remember the quote exactly or the statistic, but if you're a 98% shooter in the range, you know, in a nice warm range where you can take your time and shoot, you're about a 25% shooter when it comes to stress and outside situation. So it's a sad fact that unfortunately at times, law enforcement officers are forced to respond to actions of suspects by using deadly force, and this is a clear-cut case of that. Chief, is it normal for officers to take about 18 minutes to respond to an incident like this? We've got to remember it was a Friday night, and the, what the first thing they did was there was no one in service. So what you first heard was a general broadcast where you heard the dispatcher say, we have a domestic violence with injury, 630 leech. And then, I don't know, I don't remember the numbers, but a short time after that, you heard an officer say, you can give us a baker, which means they finished their report from St. Vincent's Hospital, and they had, the, had headed that way. Shortly after that, another crew said, okay, we're done with what we can do. We'll go ahead and, and, uh, and respond. Domestic violence is a priority two call, which is just under one. One is license sirens. Two is we need you there as quickly as you can. So when we hear domestic violence or other priority two call, they try to wrap up what they're doing so they can get there quickly. Chief, does that change at all when you have a dispatcher on the phone who is hearing um, a potential 
Yelling at citizens. Well, I, I don't remember if she said she heard yelling, but um, if if we knew more information, like if he was firing rounds into the into the bathroom, that would have bumped that up to a priority one, and they would have sent the cavalry there. Um, but based on the information that that dispatcher and call taker had, rather, that would state as a priority two, and, and as soon as crews freed themselves up, they got there. Chief, while this wasn't a standoff, at what point do you make that decision to bring in a potential negotiator? In a situation like that, when we can hear screaming and yelling, and a call taker is telling us she's hiding in the bathroom whispering, he's threatening to kill her, he slammed her head against the ground, we're not going to wait because we don't want that woman or that victim or whomever to be killed by that suspect because we're, we wait. The officers did exactly what I would have done if I was out there. I would have kicked the door in the exact same way. And if they didn't, and God forbid something would have happened to that victim, then we would have had a whole other uh, issue to deal with. Did, did the officers respond properly by kicking in the door and then announcing themselves, or should they have said They knocked. Ahead of they knocked first, but the, the, the suspect didn't answer. When they kicked the door in, they did exactly what they did. You heard it. They yelled, police. And they, we saw what happened. Sadly, I think this was going to be the ending this is the ending that that person wanted. I hate to say that. Um, we see it all the time, but Toledo Police, unless something, piece of evidence or uh, something else happens, I'm confident in saying that those officers did exactly what they were supposed to do and they followed procedures that the way we train them. On a personal level, obviously your officers are trained to remain safe in any way they can, but how heartbreaking is it to see a situation like uh, this where somebody still ends up dying? Well. I don't know if you were looking at me during this. I'm, I, it, it affects you. I mean, you can wear the badge, you can be reporters, you can be whatever. Watching that is traumatic. And I'm telling you, those guys, this is the last thing that they wanted. De-escalation is always the goal. But in a situation like this, that person took that, that goal out of our hands. Um, there was no way we could back out and say, hey, let's talk about this. He brought it. He brought a gun to a fight, and, and sadly, this is how it ended. And Chief, on <clears throat> Facebook Live, he mentioned a detective. I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, we're still looking into that, on, uh, Captain Sergo. Unless you know something. Okay. No, uh, I don't know what detective he was referring to. Mayor, when you watch that video, what do you see? Do you see the same thing that the, the chief is talking about? Do you feel the same way that the officers acted appropriately? <clears throat> Um, when I see that video, um, the first emotion that I feel is one of sadness, um, and and that's because uh, it's, you know we are seeing uh, a human life um, end, and um, it is hard to remember in cases like this. But uh, uh, Mr. O'Neill certainly had people who uh, uh, loved him uh, and if depending on your faith uh, you might say that you know he was a child of God and made in the image and likeness of God that's what I believe so to see uh, him die is traumatic sad heartbreaking however I know um, that had our officers not responded the way they did, there is a very high likelihood um, that damage up to and including death could have occurred to the woman in uh, the bathroom or the little four-month-old baby. And I know she said on her 911 call that it was a one-month-old baby. We think it was a four-month-old baby. So there are, um, you know, there uh, you know, there are no, this story has, has no happy endings. Um, uh, but when you think about the mission of a uh, police department to protect and to serve, um, I am struck by the role that our police played in protecting the life and welfare of uh, the woman, uh, the mom, and the four-month-old. And I think that's, I am overcome with that emotion more than anything else. I understand that we are uh, in an environment where there's a debate about policing and de-escalation tactics, you know, everything. Uh, everything that you have asked or are thinking about asking. 
there is just no other response when someone is pointing a gun at your face than to respond the way these officers did. I don't know how to say it any more plainly. Um, you know, you, you had a Mr. O'Neill was standing about six feet away from these officers and was pointing a gun at them. We can have a debate in this country about the right way to police. There's no way anyone will convince me uh, that the natural and appropriate response from those officers was to protect their own lives and in so doing protect the lives of the mom and, and the baby. So that's how I see it. If other, I can imagine others may disagree, but that's, that's how I see it. Um, I might also just say logistically, because I, I forgot to mention this earlier, um, you know, events like these are um, tough on a community. And uh, I want the media to know that uh, we pulled together our, we call it our rapid response team, uh, which is a group that involves faith leaders, um, you know, civil rights groups, pastors, uh, members of city council and others. Uh, we had a Zoom call with the chief uh, Saturday afternoon. Um, and then we brought that group together again this morning at 11 uh, and shared with them the video and the audio that you saw. So it's, it's part of, um, you know, part of our commitment to share information, including to members of the community, um, you know, who may uh, see the events differently than I saw them. Uh, whatever problems we have in the world, we're never going to solve them if we don't talk to one another. And so that's why we, we made it a point to call together our rapid response team not once but twice in the last uh, last 72 hours. Um, all right, I'm sure if you guys want to do individuals, we can do that. But thanks for coming, everybody. I appreciate it.